Good afternoon, and thank you for your invitation. My name is Ahmed Ismail. I am the Laura H. Carnell Professor and Dean of the Kornberg School of Dentistry, Temple University in Philadelphia. The dental school was established in 1863, so it has a long history of uh, or a legacy in development in all phases of dentistry uh, from the G.V. Black era until today. Uh, I am honored to be invited to address you today. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee, especially Dr. Reem Shafi and Mr. Suhail Shafi, who Dr. Reem Shafi is an alumna of the school and she's a strong supporter of Temple Dental and we appreciate her leadership. My lecture today will focus really on global issues and the way I see things from my perspective as a former researcher, I still do research and write, but most of my time is into planning, strategic planning, administration, positioning, and leadership of a large organization, over 1,000 people who work or study at the dental school. So we will go step by step giving you uh, some ideas, some thoughts, hopefully that will guide you in your planning. I strongly appreciate that you're, focus, you're focusing on uh, public health as well as newer management of all diseases in dentistry and oral health, but most importantly also on infection control, an area that has taken a more central and important role with the COVID-19 era. And I will go over some of these points later on in my lecture. A very good important starting point for the uh, lecture is really what happened over the last eight months. Um, reports starting in December or even before um, of a strange uh, or very unique combination of symptoms that uh, were not seen before in Wuhan, China. Initially, these uh, reports were uh, neglected or not looked at, and the people who made these comments were punished. Uh, however, uh, this is very important for us is to pay attention in health to trends and things that are very out unique or outliers. Uh, what we discovered in the last uh, months, several months, is that this virus, which is only about 0.1 microns in diameter, does not discriminate against people, has no passport. It goes from one country to another country and may have mutated several times. Uh, the health impact ranges from no symptoms, and we have people in the de my dental schools who are tested positive, have no symptoms at all, one individual recently, to deadly symptoms that lead to really death. Um, it does not like good oral hygiene. Oh, sorry, it does not like good hygiene, hand hygiene, facial hygiene. Um, saliva and other fluid droplets, especially nasal droplets, can transmit the virus. There are reports of airport, uh, airport transmission, transmission as well. It is stealthy. It attacks when viral load reaches a certain level and people don't feel it and don't see it. And that's why they continue their lives sometimes ignoring the proper preventive strategies, which all organizations and scientists have talked about. Uh, the other experience we have with this uh, pandemic is that humanity was not ready for it. Our public health systems throughout the world were not ready for it. Uh, our public health system, which is really the army that fights diseases couldn't find this virus very well. Over, over the decades, we have neglected public health throughout the world. As a result, this virus disrupted political systems, countries, and most detrimentally, low-income wage earners who lost their jobs and livelihood. And then it started to weaken the world economy. These are all very somber signs uh, in our time that we need to learn from and prepare for the future. Another important uh, basic information uh, that have many lessons in it is that um, 
SARS-2 or COVID SARS-CoV-2 is weak and does not survive alone. It is killed with soap and water. So hand hygiene is very important. It's killed by many disinfectants, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and even natural ingredients such as thymol. And there are products in the United States that are sold and approved by the Environmental Protection Agency that has thymol, thymol in it, which uh, has high pH and it's less corrosive. We can prevent the infection by donning of masks. We can prevent ourselves from being inf infected by donning of face shields. We can prevent it by social distancing. All of these measures are simple preventive measures, requires that people change their behaviors and adopt them. Unfortunately, at least in my country, these things were not followed all the time and not in all states. So as a result, we have major problems in some states now because the preventive measures are not followed. Public health measures are simple and effective if applied universally. Another observation is now diseases have no borders. As I said, no passports. And they travel and infect people in, around the globe very easily with people traveling uh, from one country to another, airplanes and other means. So we must consider all conditions um, as global conditions. Even dental caries, it's a global disease. It doesn't matter where you're located, the management of the disease should be the same. And this is a very important public health observation, is today we have global public health, global public health, and we need a global public health strategies as well as workforce. So another lesson of what happened, at least in my country for the last uh, four months is that we have a disruptive uh, force. Uh, disruptive changes happened in society. Our educational system and higher education as well as elementary education, all levels of education has been disrupted. Uh, we moved overnight from lecture-based in-classroom teaching to uh, uh, online teaching. Uh, we were prepared because we record all our lectures. So we activated lectures that have already been recorded from previous year, and we continued the courses and added to them live sessions through Zoom online with the students. And then we moved to teach electronically um, uh, some clinical aspects of practice without, of course, hands-on training, but most importantly was decision-making uh, and clinical uh, critical analysis. So that disruptive change has some positive impact, but the negative impact is that we were not able to treat patients or train or educate students in preclinical situation or preclinical labs for about four months. Higher education is going to face a dilemma for the next 12 months. And even with the availability of vaccines, it's still the problem is not going to be resolved because at least in this country, we cannot force compliance 100% with vaccines. The healthcare system has suffered as well a lot, a lot in this country because for months, all elective procedures stopped, all doctor visits stopped. And even now, uh, there's a lot of restrictions to see a physician uh, fearing that the patient has COVID-19. Uh, the business community, some businesses thrived, like Amazon and all businesses that are engaged into delivery to homes. Um, yet other businesses like restaurants uh, are, are suffering a lot and restaurants start to close. So it's a simple virus, less than 0.1 micron that was able to change significantly our lives. So disruptive changes now have to be considered as part of this uh, uh, COVID, uh, as part, part of this era. And we need to find ways where we can do better and survive them and maybe innovate. The standard operating procedures of the past may not be the best way to move forward. Leading now into another area of public health is that the disparities or inequalities that exist uh, 
among people. The people who have wealth can survive disasters better. The people who don't have wealth, who depend on monthly paychecks, hourly wages, will have sustained economic hardship, which will impact even more on their physical, psychological, and cognitive functioning. When we move to online education, at least at the university level, it may be a lot easier. We have provided uh, notebooks uh, to students who don't have them, but all of them have already a notebook. But when we talk about elementary school or high school education, availability of notebooks and computers at home vary significantly based upon the wealth status of the family. And if a family has only one computer shared by a number of kids and the parents, it becomes a problem. In addition, access to the internet is restricted by area where people live as because different investment into infrastructure or the investment in the infrastructure is different. So uh, here where we see all the aspects of public health uh, uh, in that in a population of a country that will be inequalities in health and resources, which will impact significantly on the society as a whole. Um, and that is very unfortunate. As we move into discussing how we uh, plan for public health activities, we need to understand that public health is operations of systems. So you need to think of systems, thinking and system design. Who are the partners you're going to have? It's not just community organizations and professional organizations. You need partners at different level from the top of the leadership of the country or the state or the city, uh, different community organizations, uh, as well as professional organizations. So you need to have a transdisciplinary think tank to think of how to uh, address the issues that you're facing in public health or in our health. Um, and uh, look, this is a, a slide came from the tobacco control measures. Um, what are the activities that are being done? Um, you have in-depth review of the key effective measures that you need to adopt. Uh, and uh, what are the key issues and knowledge of the people who are practicing dentistry or practicing uh, in other fields such as barbers, for example, with, uh, with infection control uh, and what's their point of view and what environment they work in so that you can provide them with the tools that fit that environment. Um, and you need to listen to people a lot. And that's why you hold focus groups and workshops to bring them to bring the issues for them to understand. This box here is actually the most important part of the slide. And in it, it has, um, uh, it has a number of factors. One is system knowledge. Uh, you need to understand how decisions are made uh, throughout the healthcare system and the political system in the country. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to understand that, but uh, how you provide the best evidence-based practices to the targeted uh, policymakers. Uh, and what's our economic impact of these practices, positive or negative? But health is always positive uh, because it's a major investment to have health. Um, then what are the effective collaborations and relationship among the stake stakeholders and the different professional organizations? Um, how you model the complex into simple uh, dynamic interactions? In this case, this slide about tobacco systems. Um, and then how you organize a system to achieve results, which one comes first. Uh, we tend to make simple decisions that may be not effective. Telling people what to do when they don't have the resources to do them and what doesn't fit their working habits and environment is problematic. You have to customize to the people your interventions. What I did mention in the previous uh, slide uh, is uh, the story of how seat belts were widely adopted in the United States. Uh, for a long time, there were recommendations for wearing seat belts from the 1950s, but the adoption of wearing seat belts was minimal until the advocates for seat belt use um, focused on passing laws 
that will consider uh, which will consider uh, having a child in a car without a seat belt as a form of child neglect or abuse especially if the car is involved in an accident so the parents knew that it is serious they have to uh, put the child in a car seat or the child is old uh, just to put the seat belts around them so the seat belts were used with car seats or for older children without car seats but the parents were not wearing the seat belts were not buckling so the children were looking at the parents and say something is odd here you know the parents are you know the child is looking this is her or her eyes at the father or mother driving and they're not wearing a seat belt so the mothers and fathers start to also buckle up and uh, wear, put the seat belt on that's a very effective powerful approach to implement change and the message i have is that change is a constant of life and when change is around you please change and i think we are entering an era of a significant change in dentistry in health um, and an area a new era of globalization as i said before in health health is global it's not just local public health is not uh, it's, it's a field that has been practiced for uh, centuries but uh, uh, the first effort really to uh, in public health was measures were taken uh, mostly in the 1600s and 1700s to uh, uh, reduce communicable diseases. Um, throughout the ages, communicable diseases were major, major killers. And without the availability of antibiotics or any preventive measures, um, whether it's physicians or, um, uh, or other political figures or policy makers started to interest in who has disease uh, and who does not have the disease and why there are differences. I think the famous uh, uh, study of Dr. John Snow in, in London, uh, where he uh, mapped the cases of cholera, cholera and found that there are clustering of cases in certain area. And that's all was related to the a water well that was contaminated by sewage. So um, that was a public health measure that saved lives is to, you know, remove that w water well from operations. Now they didn't know why, but there's clustering. Even water fluoridation, uh, when it started is that they didn't know why there's modeling of teeth, which is not a communicable disease, but it's a good example. A dentist observed something that is very unique in a population in one city but not in another city and after maybe about 20 years they figure out that it's fluoride in the water that's in high concentration causing uh, this uh, condition but later on further research found that also in certain levels or certain concentrations does not cause that mottling of teeth or fluorosis but protect from caries so the first era of public health was more dealing with communicable diseases uh, the second era started when we start to, as societies developed um, and diet changed um, and became more uh, processed uh, and uh, became the era of the chronic diseases, which we still suffer from in industry and in, mostly in, um, in all over the world now, because that's a common global problem. Um, at one point in time, when I studied public health at the University of Michigan in the 1980s, no one wants to go into the infectious disease epidemiology track. Everyone was going to the chronic disease epidemiology track, not knowing that uh, we were, uh, this is the late 79, 80, we were about to hit the HIV epidemic where infectious diseases became, again, one of the major forces for uh, uh, or major diseases to combat uh, in, in public health. The third revolution started in public health in the 80s, uh, or where we start to focus not into the traditional public health uh, measures, but what's the impact of uh, public health on the wellness of societies? What is the quality of life? How we can promote health? And promotion of health is not in the realm of only healthcare uh, providers or hospitals, but is in society at large. Uh, so the fo focus started to talk about wellness, exercise, diet, uh, control of um, tobacco use, alcohol use, 
um, all the things that could cause damage to our body and our mental health as well. And treatment started to be considered as necessary, but it's a sign that we have failed to prevent disease. So the third revolution focuses on health promotion and disease prevention. And that has been the theme until today. In fact, we practice all of these uh, stages, communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and promotion of health and wellness of society. But the emphasis and the investment into these areas. Now we are into a different area. We are into the COVID-19, what I call the fourth revolution. Uh, we live in one globe in, of interconnected humanity. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, the virus doesn't differentiate among us. And this is perhaps one of the first waves of viruses like that. Others will come and maybe more deadly. What affect one of us will affect all. Systems of surveillance, early and rapid adaptation, and non-politicized interventions are required to combat the new threat. We need organizations like the World Health Organization. It must be global public health. We need to have the intelligence to look at one country and what's happening in it, and then learn from the lessons of one country to prevent it from spreading to the other country. We need a worldwide public health force that's trained, empowered to make decisions for the good of the public. It has access to the best computers and cloud-based systems in the world. They have apps to track diseases as well track movement of people. They need to have biological and epidemiological investigations and power to investigate diseases as they start and maybe to develop treatments or vaccine for them in a rapid way. We need measures for mitigating a new trends of or new infections like we talk about now about COVID and we need to develop vaccines. This is really the realm of public health in the 21st century. Unfortunately, this is not what we are having right now. Hopefully in the next few months and next few years, as the world will recognize that we need to have one public health system coordinated, multiple multi country-based systems, but they are coordinated and linked so that we can do the proper intelligence to understand disease as it moved from one country to another or prevented from spreading. A disease in one country, an ep epidemic in one country is a pandemic for the world that we need to prepare for it. So this leads me to a very important point uh, in the fight uh, for our health and health in general. And uh, by the way, if you see the video different and my picture is different because I had to change machines, it took me uh, overnight to come to my office because my other PC at home crashed. Uh, so I apologize for that. And that delayed me by about uh, 14 hours to deliver the presentation. Um, and this is a very key term here or key statement. Poverty is a major determinant of health. Um, and I came to a realization that a lot of the things we do uh, in prevention and community health, if we do not address the root cause of disease, which is poverty, we're not going to make a big difference. And the way to address it is through education, economic development in communities, through employment. Um, and that should be a major function of governments is to eliminate poverty in its population uh, because health cannot be achieved in an impoverished nation. So taking you from the general uh, concept of health, public health to the dental public health. Um, and this is my definition of dental public health. It's not the one you find in textbooks uh, because again, um, it's focused, the traditional definition focused on prevention and promotion uh, in community settings. And my concept is that everything we do and every aspects of life and everything we do in a dental practice have implications on dental health and on public health. Um, most of the, uh, as an epidemiologist, when I measure disease, especially dental caries in the United States, 80% of it is already determined by dentists uh, through their restorations. We have a very highly uh, restored population 
so we don't know whether that's disease or misdiagnosis of disease and which stage of disease they measured it. Um, of course, I assume that dentists will fill teeth based upon certain criteria they have developed throughout their experience and education. Um, but there are significant variations among dentists of when to restore a tooth and not restore a tooth. So dental public health really is scientifically based specialty of dentistry and public health. It links between public health and dentistry, integrates knowledge and experiences from dental, behavioral, public health, educational, political sciences. These are things that we don't study in dental schools. And we need to go to another school or public health school to learn about them because using these tools uh, make life a lot easier for those who plan programs. Um, I was, I've been working for the last few days with students trying to establish dental care, a program of dental care for homeless people in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and their ideas are very global and also very general and not that specific, and they don't know where to go. Uh, again, because of what I consider public health is really networking with a lot of organizations and people for a common mission, uh, we were able very quickly to identify where we go, with whom we talk, and who are the policy makers or decision makers that we'll work with. Without that knowledge, people go in circles and not achieve anything. So this experience, this knowledge on the sciences uh, is combined with experiences in business management, marketing, and advocacy. I personally don't believe that everything should be voluntary and that voluntary program eventually will die because people lose interest. Uh, however, a program has to be financially sustainable and supported either by outside agencies, government, or from its own resources. And ideally that the program, if it's a clinical program and a public health program, it has to generate some revenues from the services it provides. Um, and then there is an issue of advocacy, advocating through networking and through positioning of your message. Uh, and the purpose of that is to promote health and our health all the time. And we provide in dentistry primary, secondary, and tertiary care. And we provide that for individuals and populations. In a dental practice, you provide, it, you provide care for individuals. And pop, in community health, you provide it to large populations. Uh, even community health, clinical care, we can provide to population groups in community settings. Primary is the um, prevention of disease before it starts. And secondary is the prevention of early disease from progressing. And tertiary is really the restoration of health. So dentistry really encompass all of these functions. Uh, sorry about that. Um, encompass all the functions of primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now this, this is slide um, encompass uh, uh, another model, which is very important called the upstream downstream model in your planning. Again, it emphasized what the definition that we just completed in a few moments. And that's uh, in order to impact health, you don't think only of the clinical prevention, but rather you need to think of the education and school-based education, community-based education. But these are things we can do at our dental level. But there are media campaigns which could have significant impact. And, and the reason people react to media campaigns is because they see them widely on te television or hear them on radio or see them on posters. And uh, they try to adopt behaviors. It's just marketing health is equivalent to marketing an automobile or clothes or watches um, and become a trend. Everyone in the United States want white teeth uh, that was created through marketing, but not by the dental community, but by industry. Uh, training of other professional groups to engage into promoting health. Um, and uh, we rely a lot on transportation. So transportation is important for us to bring patients to the clinics. Uh, community development is important because as I said, if we improve, uh, reduce poverty, we improve health. We also improve the quality of dental care we provide and the patients who seek different types of dental care. Instead of moving for extractions, they move into restoration of teeth. Uh, working on healthy setting and health promoting schools, the fiscal measures that are required to support these activities, and then legislation and regulations, which are, could be very profound and important, especially in the area of licensure. Uh, we have legislation about tobacco. We have legislation in the city of Philadelphia about taxes on soft drinks. Um, 
these have profound effect on the population and decision making. And then there is national and local policy initiatives that are taken to promote health. So trying to implement all these models is for you is, is going to be challenging, I think, but you need to think in a simplified approach, which is what do we do for the target populations we want to change and improve their health? Uh, what are the approaches? Who are the partners? What can we do with them? And then we have the community um, at large, community organizations, uh, what's the interest of the community? What are the challenges of the community? Because you may propose something that to you is very good, but to the community is not that important. Think of the policy and decision makers you need to engage into your initiatives and what their understanding and their priorities. Uh, and if priority of your program is not that high, you need to justify why they need to consider it. And then you have the healthcare providers. Uh, and on this issue, I don't think it's all solutions are uh, with oral health or dental health are in the hands of the dentists. Uh, you need to involve other healthcare providers, whether it's physicians, uh, nurses, community health workers, um, uh, village workers, uh, whatever you have in your country is very important. Uh, and the reason why I present this information to you is that to stress that the determinants of oral health are not always in the dental office and in the clinical care we provide. And we spent all of our education on the clinical care we provide, which is very important. But in this case, this is a study looking at uh, early childhood caries, 60 families with early childhood caries and 60 without. You see that the, uh, the factors is history of sleeping while uh, feeding is almost increased the risk or the odds of getting early child caries by 10. Uh, this behavior by itself, uh, if you don't change it, then all the efforts to treat the disease, early child caries, and in the United States, most likely that will be under general sedation or general anesthesia or deep sedation. Uh, that's very costly. Uh, frequency of brushing once a day versus two to three times a day, that also is about five times the odds. Um, a person don't brush at all versus a child brushes more frequently, especially after meals, the odds of preventing disease is high and the odds of getting disease is high. The odds of preventing is high. The odds of receiving disease is also, or getting disease is high. Father, last dental visit, the behaviors of the parents become important here. And that's, you have about increase of odds of about 2.5. The, this is very important here, this history of sleeping while feeding. That's a behavior that mothers and fathers should pay attention to because it really causes a lot of agony for the child. So what I would like to do now is to move to another area, which is a brand new area for us in the United States and around the world. It's appearing more and more in the medical field than the dental field, and we're catching up and we're actually very unique. Uh, because we have a unique microbiome in our oral cavity. There are about 10, 100 trillion bacteria of several hundred species bearing about 3 million non-human genome on each body, in, inside, and on the skin. So we are really not one organism. We're not a single organism with one genome, but we are a super organism. And that's really the beauty of uh, our creation, is that we are carrying with us a lot of cells that don't belong to the human body, but they are part of our life. Uh, so uh, we are super, super human beings or super organism carrying all the um, gene genomes of the bacterial species with us. Some of them are crucial for our health. Some of them cause disease. Uh, dental caries, periodontal disease, and oral cancer are related to the oral microbiome. Again, a simple concept, in my opinion, is understanding the oral microbiome is going to be key for achieving health and oral health. Um, understanding the gut microbiome is key for uh, health. Uh, all these important, I'm just putting it in one statement, which is going to be the area of interest uh, and focus uh, for the next decades. So I still remember when studying in dental school in the 70s, uh, the focus was on uh, the discovery of strep, strep mutans uh, as uh, one of the uh, causing bacterial species of dental caries was a major development. And a lot of the work was focused on that species as well as lactobacillus. Um, but uh, that was oversimplistic model. There are about uh, 3,700 
3,600 species level phylotypes in saliva and about 7,000 in plaque. We cannot study them with the microbiological techniques we had before, so we need new techniques, uh, mostly metagenomics techniques and other omics uh, to study this very large and complex community. We focused on less than 10% of these bacterial species uh, or types. Uh, so I think we are heading towards a different understanding and we'll see the commonality that we are also having um, different patterns of oral microbiome, but these patterns are the same across populations and across countries. So understanding dental caries, the microbiome disease, is understanding that there is an ecology in the oral cavity and we maintain it through a number of factors. One of them is our behaviors. Uh, and dental caries is a multifactorial disease that starts with my microbiological shifts within this complex microbiome uh, and, uh, and it's affected by saliva, definitely flow of saliva is very important, uh, composition of saliva, exposure to fluoride, consumption of dietary sugars and oral health behaviors. These are factors that all impact the microbiome. So when people say why some people brush and have no disease and people don't brush, is that the first effectiveness of brushing and second, they may have different microbiome that brushing alone would not change it. So as recent studies are appearing on the, uh, and this is using different techniques, we use metagenomic databases looking at the genomes of different species, thousands uh, of species and match them with disease versus non-disease or caries versus non-caries. Uh, we're finding patterns that there are a group of fam or a family of bacteria that are both acidogenic and acidiuric. That means they can produce acids and they can live in very low pH. That causes dental caries uh, or associated with uh, more common or more frequently find, found in individuals, in this case children, with dental caries. So it's no longer one or two species, it's really a family of bad bacteria. This is a very important concept, is that if there is um, these cells or bacterial cells or species that will produce acids, there will be a demineralization of the surface, the outer surface of enamel. Uh, you don't see it, I don't see it in the initial stages. Um, and many people are spending a lot of time and energy to detect these very early changes. Um, the tools are very expensive. The disease is initially reversible. Uh, if we change ecology, we can change the demineralization to remineralization. We can actually do that at any stage, even when there is cavitation. But of course, when you have a cavity, you have a different reality uh, or different situation there where there's a trap for bacteria and food that needs to be treated. Um, and uh, so oral hygiene, a removal, a very efficient and effective oral hygiene. There's a, a, a series of studies from Denmark in a community called Nexo, which they had performed uh, extensive school-based oral hygiene program. And they have demonstrated that they could almost eliminate caries with removing of the, of the plaque, which is the microbiome. Uh, it starts very early in life and continues in that small community uh, until the child you know, enters high school. Um, we, of course, that doesn't, uh, the conditions that we live in and the population we serve are different than that community, but it proves the concept that uh, uh, we have many tools that we can, simple tools, uh, if practice well, we can prevent disease or reduce the burden of disease significantly in societies. This individual, um, I examined him in Nova Scotia, Canada, about 20 years ago. Uh, or 25 years ago, and uh, was very unique uh, that this heavy accumulation of plaque uh, for that child was very different than the rest of the uh, high school students we examined. And you can see the a lot of information could be gathered from here, not on the, uh, the, con the, con the content of this plaque, what is the microbiological basis for this plaque, but most of the social behavioral factors that led to this accumulation of plaque and also to the initiation of caries. I want to bring to your attention um, 
here is this line here, the white line. These are white demineralization lines that are surrounding a cavity. There's a, big, there's a white demineralization line very visible here. And here underneath it, when we removed it, we also saw white demineralization lines. Black accumulation, heavy black accumulation, acids, demineralization, change in opacity of enamel, leading to eventually the enamel will collapse and we have cavitation. Simple, uh, profound understanding of caries could really do uh, a lot for this individual, but we cannot treat it only at the clinic. We have to understand why he is in this situation, what is his home situation, what are the social behavioral factors that led him to this condition. And it's not just about drilling and filling his teeth. So understanding, understanding dental caries requires understanding also the stages of the disease. There are no discrete stages and it is a continuous process. We have for uh, a decade or sorry, for a century now, since G.V. Black classified it into uh, either cavitated or non-cavitated, fill or no fill. Even G.V. Black and uh, later in his life, uh, he started talking about enamel caries. And this classification look at caries into stages, which is the enamel caries. In this case, in pits and fissure is stained. It reaches the DJ. Uh, it may not appear on radiograph. This one may not appear on radiograph. It, it, and it may appear when it's advanced to the DEJ, close to the DEJ, dental enamel junction. Uh, and this is stained from the oral cavity and appears a light brown, dark brown. Sometimes in the early stages, if you find it very early stages, you may can find white demineralization. Uh, this stage is more advanced where caries now is into dentin, both here, these examples. The tooth may not be cavitated, but the caries in dentin, you see those in radiographs. And this also a different conservative management. It may require uh, restorative care. There's a difference between some countries, especially Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries and the United States in terms of uh, filling these lesions or not filling these lesions. They don't fill if there's no cavitation. They don't drill if there's no cavitation. And these lesions here, there is cavitation. There's more in, uh, one third of dentin and more is involved. More than one third of dentin is involved. Uh, so this is the ICDAS classification. Just I want presented to you to uh, to to demonstrate the issues of understanding caries as a continuum and not a one disease. Now, in this presentation here, I, it's very important to understand when you look at caries is where is it located, because different locations may have different um uh measurement of risk uh, in a follow-up study for two years if children have no caries the chance that they develop new caries in this case is increase in mean dmfs is minus is low as 1.4 lesions we don't know whether that's the filling that because the stained fissure were filled or not but that is the uh, lowest of the uh, uh, level to be found pits and if it's scarcity free, it's about 1.4. If it's piston fissure, is about 2.9. Um, and if it's maxillary anterior caries, smooth surfaces, the child is at higher risk of caries. Uh, so when you classify populations, just look where diseases, and that's a good prediction of the future. Now here, where I present to you different types of lesions, again, these are all not to be restored. There has been a disturbance in the microbiome, this our teeth have been cleaned. So you can see the white demineralization line. Usually they follow the gingival margin. That's how plaque accumulates and they occur, occur in adjacent teeth because uh, people miss a segment of teeth when they brush their teeth. Now these, these lesions, if identified at this stage, they could, you could apply fluoride and prevent them from progressing. Now, this is what I was referring to as a stained pits and fissures. In this case, what appears as shallow, as small, but there's cavitation here, really. Uh, and you can see that it goes all the way to dentin. Um, very conservative restoration. Uh, you don't need to do the classical GV black lesion uh, cavity preps for these. And those survive very well with a very conservative management of this unique situation, this is very early stage of pit and fissure caries, and you can see the white demineralization area just beginning. This will be stained over in a very short period of time, but we caught it just at the beginning of it. As the tooth is erupting, usually that's what happens, black accumulates, and you have a lesion uh, that's the beginning of demineralization in that service. 
what we like to prevent is this condition where the enamel now is weak uh, because it's demineralized and it collapses and you have a small micro cavitation or small cavitation, not micro. Um, and this again, conservative management, instead of drilling all this and trying to prevent it from progressing, good oral hygiene and fluoride and filling this area uh, will be sufficient to manage a disease. Uh, this, these data are from Detroit, my study in Detroit for 1,000 families followed for four years. And you can see two important things. One is the severity of disease level one, level one, and level two in the ICDAS system. Uh, here, these lesions are deeper into enamel, maybe reaching dentin about one third of the time, and these lesions are all in enamel. Age is a factor. At detecting these lesions in younger age group, uh, less than three years, uh, um, a lot of these lesions will progress uh, to the next stage of uh, cavitation. Um, and uh, that means early intervention with preventive methods at an early age is very important. Now we move into a different stage where there is now the level three and four of the ICDAS, uh, where there is this halo around it, which means the caries has spread uh, internally into enamel and dentin, and then there is this small cavitation. This lesion now is to be treated also conservatively. Uh, the GV black model is no longer valid to be used, it's destructive. If he were alive with us today, he would be the first one to reject it because we have now tools and materials and techniques that we can conservatively treat this lesion and keep it healthy and the tooth will function rather than doing the classical cavity designs. Uh, now, this is uh, just to summarize for you the different stages of early childhood caries. And the point I would like to make is that the white lesions in the first slide here show that uh, there has been demineralization in early stages. These stages could be prevented with oral hygiene uh, at home, as well as fluoride application in a clinic as well as using fluoridate toothpaste, even in the younger age, sometimes that's not recommended, but good oral hygiene is very important. Uh, otherwise, these lesions will progress to cavitation, full destruction of the tooth and loss of teeth. And you have here retained roots and that could lead to infection and expensive treatment. Uh, so early detection is very key to, uh, to management of the disease. To emphasize, early detection of caries is key in any health program, in any clinical practice. Unfortunately, it's not widely practiced, even in my country. Uh, the focus is what to restore, and that's because of the way we pay dentists here. We pay them for filling teeth. We don't pay them for keeping teeth from filling. So the financial model is a flawed. It, it encourages treatment. Uh, this brings me to a, a very important issue, especially with children and young children. They're seen by physicians early in life, uh, the age of one, uh, most likely they will have a vaccination, uh, and physicians and nurses should be trained to detect these early stages. They could be detected without really a dental unit, using light and two by two gauze and uh, uh, it, it's very, uh, it's very, it has been demonstrated in studies that physicians will have the same accuracy as dentists in detecting caries. Uh, there are a lot of uh, myths about seeing children before the age of three. Uh, children should be seen as soon as possible after the eruption of teeth, uh, six months to one year. Uh, the purpose of that is not to drill their teeth, but actually to teach their parents how to care for their teeth as well or their oral health as well as to uh, uh, detect early signs of disease. I think involving social workers is key in many countries into, because they have reached into the communities and the villages, um, social workers, community health workers, uh, as well as the caregivers, the parents into prevention of disease. They all could be trained to do some part of this process of detection and prevention. Now, we talked about caries as a uh, microbiological shift that's affected by many factors uh, that leads to demineralization and then leads to cavitation and more advanced stages. So how we manage it? What is the current management strategies? I'm not going to present you in a short lecture on different approaches. I think you get my, I'm a conservative person, a minimalist dentist 
to try to preserve two structure. Um, I do work with money a lot and I do care about money a lot as well. But I do believe that if we are more conservative and more preventative, we will have a better uh, practice and we have a larger population of satisfied patients and we will uh, control disease. The best successful treatment is when patient doesn't come to you uh, complaining that the work did not succeed. So here's where the problem with the, uh, with the current management strategies. And this is if you deal with early childhood caries in the United States, most likely children with, uh, at the age of three who have caries, they will end up uh, with cavitation. They will end up uh, treated into a sedation center or even a hospital. And uh, six months after treatment, the recidivism is very high. One in five, uh, they will return back with more caries, more new caries, and as if treatment was not provided to them. Why? Because the risk factors were not ad addressed. Um, we need a major change in the tertiary care of children with nursing caries. It cannot be done in a hospital. And for many countries, that's impossible to do. Um, and then that we have to have a community approach to managing early child. This is really the current model and thinking uh, that we developed with the collaboration with uh, cardiologists and public health and epidemiologists and dentists from different countries. It is what we have written for my dental school and it was really the guidelines for management, whether it's practice is a different issue, though we are rewarding students now for managing disease, uh, outcomes of managing disease. So we have something called patient wellness profile or report in which the students will track 14 indicators of disease, including whether disease has been treated and whether early lesions are being managed and stopped from progressing. Um, and we consider those as uh, they need to do 30 complete patients to graduate. Staging in comprehensive care, you need to stage a disease to make a diagnosis, both clinically and radiographically for now. Risk assessment, how, what is the factors that lead to disease? A comprehensive plan should include a prevention control of early lesions to from or stop them from progression, primary, secondary, minimal intervention, extensive intervention. Sometimes you may need to extract teeth and place implants and do crowns and follow up care or recall. And then the outcomes where the patient can take care of their health, whether the disease is under control and the disease is treated. So this is a very simple model for comprehensive care. When we talk about comprehensive care, it has to have four components in it. I want to move now and discuss with you some solutions, um, strategies. Uh, one of the most common solutions that talked about is access to dental care. We need uh, uh, accessibility to people to see a dentist, dentists located in areas which uh, are closer to their homes, uh, to homes of people. Uh, and this is important, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and there are many examples where access or increasing the workforce of training more dentists did not solve the problem. In my opinion, it would not solve the problem of uh, disease that we have in societies uh, or in different countries. Uh, and I think there's not enough dentists that could be trained to address some of the problems that face some of the countries um, so we need to think of access as an important, but it's not the only solution. Again, access to care is important, as I said, but it's not sufficient. And this uh, data come from Nova Scotia, where I lived for about nine years, and uh, uh, all children uh, were covered by dental insurance plan. And the program has like a, a 25 year from the mid 70s history. So these children have were born and lived uh, covered by dental uh, care from day one. All children receive the same level of care. Uh, the procedures are covered by the state or by the province. Uh, it's not full. Uh, they don't cover a lot of sealants. They don't cover sealants at all, only restorations and prevention and recall. And, um, and we can see that the education of the parents is a very important determinant of um, the mean number of decayed, missing, and filled services in, uh, in children, the primary teeth of children. Uh, again, even with universal health insurance where everyone is covered, the disparities did remain to exist. So access to care, universal health care are one factors, 
are one or two factors that are important, but they're not sufficient to achieve health. We see the same pattern um, in New Zealand, which had, uh, which still has a school-based program focused on prevention until, uh, which started about 30 years ago, but before that they focused a lot on restoring teeth um, and they moved the program run by therapists to become more preventive. And we can see that there is a trend of reductions by dep level of dep deprivation, but this highest level of deprived children from families of uh, children of, from families that are highly deprived have a higher prevalence of untreated caries. So we did not reduce much, reduce disparities, but not eliminate disparities. Uh, again, in your planning stages, you need to look at the workforce that is necessary for Pakistan. Uh, dentists are important, hygienists, uh, therapists. You need to invent the workforce that fits the population and fits the problems you have. And maybe you need to think of the, uh, the least possible trainee to provide the service to the maximum of their training. Uh, it's not all dentists and it's not all therapists, uh, but you need community health workers, you need physicians, you need nurses, you need health systems to be working with you. I think you should create a workforce that include the different sectors of the uh, of society or of the healthcare system. And this is one model that we tested, uh, did not work in our area very well of training community health workers. Community health workers are trained to reach, coordinate, communicate, educate uh, 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 population groups in need for dental care. They are the extension of the dental practice and uh, they're basically marketing and education and follow-up. Follow-up is very important. Uh, they could be trained in six months. Um, there are more longer programs for training to provide, uh, they have discussed oral health knowledge and behaviors. Uh, they learn techniques like motivational interviewing to change behaviors and develop personalized plans for uh, mothers, adults, children, and so on. They navigate care, so they schedule appointments, see that people are going to see a dentist. Uh, they understand community resources. So if they go to a family and the family needs help with food uh, or other issues, then they could provide that uh, because they know what's available in the community. The nutritional literacy is very important. They teach about appropriate nutrition, diet that would prevent caries or not cause caries, address dental anxiety about dental care, which is very prevalent. Um, and they, there are techniques to address anxiety. This is, they will be trained in them. Uh, and they review medical history and coordination of care, as I said in the, uh, before. Um, they work for a supervising provider, which is in this case, a dentist. I think this model will work in many parts of the world um, and uh, has a lot of benefits here. There was a political controversy having a community health worker, which doesn't make sense. Uh, one of the problem we made is trying community health workers to be dental assistants who are trained to do more than just the things I have mentioned here. That model has a lot of flaws in it. It's, it's a waste. Uh, you need to focus only on the outreach part, the education, the nutrition and diet and anxiety and coordination of care to support societies. So what I try to really give you pieces of information about public health and dental caries and systems and care organization. Um, and if there is I'm, one message that I want you to leave, uh, with, to leave with you is to think outside the box. Uh, and I think this quote is very important from Henry Ford, which was also borrowed by Steve Jobs. Uh, you need to, uh, to think uh, differently. If I've asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. So Henry Ford did not have a committee, neither Steve Jobs. They look at the needs and the technology and created something that people bought in and widely. The car have changed the world, uh, the automobile changed societies, and also the PCs and Apple have changed societies. No one uh, would imagine what we, how we can live without our smartphones. So I want to thank you now and wish you the best in this conference. I hope I provide you with uh, a global synopsis of some of the ideas I have and the experiences that you can use in your planning for the future. Thank you.